Uh, yes. Okay, right. Uh, yeah. The upper band valley, there's confusion about the upper and the lower band. One way of understanding what the upper band or where the upper band is, it rises up in the mountains and makes its way down into Loch Ness. So that is the upper band. And that's the area we'll be talking about tonight, not only about the linen industry, but some of the characters who uh, populated the Guildford area. Uh, my introduction to uh, uh, linen was when I was seconded to the public record office in Belfast. Uh, I was given a mentor there by uh, a teacher who had been a history teacher in uh, Lurgan uh, uh, Grammar School. And he was known as the father of Irish linen. So it was there that he produced a letter that had arrived from Dublin Museum. And it was in connection with an old lady who had died in Wexford. And as they were cleaning the house, she came across this chemise or little girl's dressing. And on it was a gold embossed uh, label entitled Guilford Mill. And I was asked to do a history of Guilford Mill for the museum. So that was my first introduction to the linen industry in the Ban Valley. When I was researching, I came across the title Linium Usitalissimum, Linen Most Useful. And if you care to look up uh, your iPad and Google, in, Google for uh, linen, you'll find out all the uses, which are quite numerous indeed. In fact, the use of flax with its textile fibers can be traced back more than 7,000 years. And it's the oldest manufacturing activity known. And we know that from the flowering plants that have been illustrated in tombs and temples in ancient Egypt and Ethiopia. In Europe, it can be traced back to the Neolithic or New Stone Age men living in lake dwellers in Switzerland. For those who are interested in the Bible, one of the 10 plagues is identified as the failure of the flex crop. Ancient Egyptians used linen cloth for mummification of the dead for burial purposes. Worshippers were only permitted into temples if they were wearing linen garments. And the, their near neighbors, the Israelites, they used linen for priest's garments. So if we could have the first slide here would be the pulling of flex. So here we see flex being pulled. You'll see there's quite a number of people involved in it. It was pulled originally by hand until during the war when Mackey's introduced the flex pulling machine. It is a very labor intensive, as you see, and it's pulled, uh, not cut, as you would harvest cereal uh, crops. Next one. It's the introduction of the old forts and tractor, bringing in the flex to be putting it to the dam for retting. And if we just see the next frame, please. This is retting, where the linen sheaves are put into a dam to be retted there for about three weeks. It was customary in our part of the world that the farmer who employed the men to wade into the dam always had a bottle of whiskey on the side of the flax dam to keep their sustenance high. I will continue on by saying that linen was seen as a symbol of light and purity, while in a materialistic sense, it was a sign of wealth. And I'm sure many of you here tonight have a sample of some linen garment or tablecloth, dressing table set uh, in the house, and you cherish it, and rightly so, because it's now a thing of the past. The production of linen was even detailed in the early Irish laws, which made it obligatory for farmers to learn the practice methods of cultivating flax. 
So it is a very important part of the farming cycle. And I fast forward to the industrialization of the linen. And the first record that I found was in the 1670s when a Thomas Purdy had possession of a tuck mill in Guildford. And it was here that uh, hand loom spinning and weaving was concentrated along the Ban Valley from Banbridge right down to my Allen. This was facilitated by having imports and exports by way of the Newry Canal, which was, uh, most of you would know was excavated in 1737. And it was exported to be bleaching, to be bleached in, which is the most important aspect of the production of linen was the bleaching. And it was important in order to get it into its white uh, and get the, all the, the different uh, assets out of the, the linen uh, flex itself. If we get a new, uh, next uh, uh, view of the bleaching, we'll see where there is some an example of just the, the degree that a bleach screen would be uh, bleaching those linen webs. They measure about 25 yards long and about one yard wide. Now, bleaching methods owe their origin in this part of Ireland to the arrival of Alexander Christie, a Quaker from Aberdeen, who came to my Allen in the year 1676. And it is his son, when they arrived in my Allen, my Allen town land was woodland and they worked diligently to remove the trees and make it a very productive area. In fact, one of the most productive and fertile uh, townlands in the neighborhood. His son, John, introduced advanced bleaching methods in the area, having arrived with the father from Aberdeenshire. He had another son, founded his own business in London, and many of you would recognize it, Christie's Hats. Another son became more old famous for the manufacture, either for the uh, establishing a well-known auctioneering house, Christie's of London. So these people were certainly uh, entrepreneurs in the proper sense of the word. To give you some idea, when they began their bleaching process in uh, the townland of my Allen, Ireland was exporting about half a million yards of linen in 1705. By 1745, it had reached seven and a quarter million yards. 1785, 26 and three quarter million yards. And early into the 19th century, it had increased to 48 million yards. The early methods of bleaching were primitive and protected, protected over a long period of time. It was usually carried out from March to September. And the ingredients for the alkali that was used for the linen uh, bleaching was kettle's urine, potash, buttermilk as an acid and a scarring agent. They were washed by hand, trampled by foot and dried in the open air. And this process was repeated a number of times until such times as deemed white enough for next processes. So like all the Quakers, the Christie showed a keen interest in applying scientific methods and experimentation to bleaching. They were always alerted to technical change. I, I'm on Zoom at the minute. Hence, Christie's a leading partner in my Allen Petrial Company, set up a, a, a Petrial Works in 1786 and he invested 10 million pounds, which is a huge sum of money by today's standards. In order to uh, have the right consistency for the alcohol and for the bleaching process, it was tasted by mouth, which was a very risky method causing frequent and costly accidents. To give you some idea of just 
how bleaching had increased significantly with the coming of the Quakers. There was a, a, an MP from London in 1804 came to visit the area around the Ban Valley. And he wrote the following. From Guildford to Banbridge, there is the closest neighborhood of opulent linen merchants. Many of these are held by the respectable society of Quakers and their establishment in the linen trade are the most considerable in the county. The delightful improvements in this view and the verdure of the lands are finely contrast, contrasted with the white webs, which cover so extensive an area, this whole country being occupied by wealthy bleachers. By 1808, with the influence of the Quakers, who I have to say introduced friends and relatives and fellow entrepreneurs from south of the border, there were 20 bleach greens between my Allen and St. Patrick's. St. Patrick, if you know where my Allen is, for those from Points Pass and District, from my Allen is midway between Guildford and Portadown. St. Patrick is in the edge of Banbridge. By the beginning of the 19th century, Evangelism was a force in Ireland, and many evangelists recognized the need to address the enormous challenges posed by industrial uh, capitalists. If you take, for example, Belfast, there's nothing but overcrowded, squalid, unhealthy conditions. So through a variety of voluntary organizations, evangelists spurred by a missionary seal organized Sunday schools, temperance movements and Bible classes. And the temperance movement in particular spread with many of its supporters being the merchants in the valley and mill owners who sought to promote class harmony and sobriety of their workforce. And that is particularly so in Guildford when we come to look at the establishment and the building of the mill in Guildford. One of Ireland's earliest Victorian purpose-built small towns was Guildford. Guildford was built during the period of a man called Hugh Dunbar, an evangelist and a Unitarian. And it was built during the period, this period. And the man had a deep religious conviction. He proved an ideal candidate for what were known as paternalistic employers. For those who ever did Latin, you'd know the name Potter means father. And paternalistic employers were treating workers in a fatherly man a manner, especially providing for their needs without any great responsibilities. So Hugh Dunbar was an ideal candidate for this role that he was to fulfill when he started to build the mill. He was reputed to have been an exemplary generous man who gave alms to the poor and needy. And it was re reckoned that he had about 100 people, 400 people to whom he gave alms every Friday. He began his linen enterprise in Guildford in 1834 on a 180-acre site that he purchased. People have often asked, why was Guildford chosen as a centre for such a huge enterprise? The reason being, that is from the earliest occasions, the 17th century, as I pointed out early, Guildford was the nucleus for the handloom weaving. And it was the canal that enabled them to export through Newry to uh, England and uh, to uh, Scotland. Dunbar subscribed to a strategy emphasizing that concern about human welfare of one's employees was morally desirable and practically profitable. So the, the two uh, go hand in hand. He attempted to provide decent working conditions in the huge mill that he built, and he retained, retained exclusive ownership of all the uh, buildings and uh, workers' houses. He was the son of a linen draper with a linen thread industry in Huntley in Banbridge. And he depended entirely on domestic spinning for his thread. Spread in 19, 1825, sorry, 
there was a, a revolutionary uh, process established in 1825 in Preston in England, and that was the wet, wet spinning process. In 1834, the competition for mill spun yarn and thread compelled Dunbar to either erect his own spinning mill or go out of business. He realized that if the industry was not re re uh, reorganized on a larger scale, it would be destroyed by the more efficient English and the Scottish competitors who were able to sell their thread at a very much lower rate. Their base costs were reduced by building large mills and factories. He saw the solution as investing in larger manufacturing units, which would secure the future of the industry here at home. Having secured the water rights and the purchase of a small mill in Guildford with a small but experienced workforce, it would be the ideal location for his expansion ambitions. Ironically, at the same time, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Marcus of Downshire, who, as you know, originated from Hillsborough. In the late seven, uh, 1700s, he purchased four town lands in and around Banbridge because he wanted to be part of the linenocracy that was now beginning to boom in the area. And he developed Banbridge into a centre for, uh, for the uh, selling and trading in the linen prodigies. At this particular time, he had further ideas. I should have said that he was secretary of the Board of Trade, so he was certainly interested in business and commerce. He had another idea that money could be saved if you could harness the water coming from the moorns. Because, as you can well realise, if you're depending on water power, as Guildford Mill was once it was built, you would have uh, droughts in the summertime and you wouldn't have that constant flow of water that enabled the turning of the turbines to get, propel the machinery in the mills and factories. So he set about organizing and uh, promoting Banbridge Reservoir Company. He purchased, la he, the company purchased land in, uh, Loch Island, Reavy, uh, Deers Meadow, and the Corbett and Ban Bridge. Now, the first two are at the foothills of the Mourns. He say, uh, say, reckoned that he would be make a saving of £8,260 annually for all the shareholders. And what he did was he sold the original shares at £50 each to all the industrialists who had settled and promoted linen along the Ban Valley. And the whole idea was that there would, would be catchment areas. So the water would be caught in the summertime or in times of drought in these reservoirs. And there were man-made or man-developed. Uh, uh, if you take, for instance, uh, Corbett Lake, it's man-made. So what they did, they introduced he introduced a, a process whereby water during the summer nights would be uh, captured in these reservoirs and the lakes and released in the morning to allow sufficient water downstream to enable the manufacturing to continue. And that was a great pro uh, uh, process in, for these industrials who sometimes had to close their works during the summertime for lack of water. The idea now was, how were you to pay for the water? You couldn't have the, this process going unless there was some a cost factor in it. And Hugh, could we get the next slide, please? This is a weir. I'm sure some of you would have noticed it in different river. And the whole process was in this particular weir here, the water takes a little bend uh, on its course. If you were to walk to the left of the picture, you come across slush gates. Those slush gates 
with the entrance to what was known as a head race or a can small canal. And the slush gates enabled the water to take its course down the left-hand side there and on downstream to where the factory or the mill was. Then how did you pay for the water? That waterfall there is at the uh, close by uh, Banford Bleach Green, or the Pot Belly Restaurant, as some of you would know. It has a certain height, and that one would be about four to five foot high. So they were charged one pounds per footfall per month for the use of the water to keep the mill moving during the times of drought or a scarcity of water. Since uh, Dunbar didn't have sufficient capital himself, he had a number of uh, partners in the business, but one of the most, uh, I suppose, the youngest and the most uh, trustworthy and, and, and who was diligent enough to work hard with Dunbar because pre the previous uh, partners had a fallout and court cases. And this young man at 20 years of age was John Walsh McMaster from Market Hill, who joined up with Dunbar McMaster. And you will note as we go through the talk that Dunbar is part of the surname, uh, the Christian name of some of the McMasters. I now go to just give you an idea of what the factory inspector said about Guilford Mill in 1846, which was in the middle of the famine. No expense is regarded that can promote the happiness or comfort of the workers. The medical attendant is then allowed a salary of 180 pounds a year. Uh, you would hardly accept that, uh, Dr. Lyons, I'm sure. A very superior school is attached to the factory, free of charge to the workers and their families, with a library, and the working hours are limited to 11 hours a day and no reduction in wages. 11 hours was a day's work in those days. There is clear evidence that Dunbar made sufficient efforts to provide for the well being of the workers on and off the job. Dunbar made huge efforts to build a community in Guildford, coinciding with a period of demographic upheaval associated with the famine of 1845. With the establishment of the mill, it attracted a large number of people to, who had been previously engaged in the domestic hand loom spinning and weaving, and mainly in from the adjoining town lands. And as you shall see in the next slide, Hugh, if we can have it. Here is, a, it's a watchtower. Could we go on? I think if we have missed one or a long sequence. Uh, what, what slide are you looking for? I'm looking for the, the, I'm looking for the census figures. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Here you are. Here we see the population of Guildford, 1831 to 1901. If you look, the Guildford Mill was officially opened in 1841. You'll see that the population of Guildford was 643. 10 years later, 1851, when the mill was at its peak, 2,814. Now you can see that continuing and then it begins to fall at the turn of the century. You see the number of females and males, operatives, the uninhabited and the inhabited houses and the uninhabited houses. When I mention, uh, when even the famine is mentioned in and around the Ban Valley, one person comes to mind and I'm going to spend a while talking about this person because he has left his mark in the vicinity 
uh, a man that had a family of very illustrative, illustrative uh, uh, writers and art, uh, artists. His name is the Reverend William Butler Yeats. Many of whom would have heard the name. There he is now in front of us. He, followed, he was born in Dublin Castle in 1806. And the reason he was uh, there, his father-in-law was uh, a chief secretary uh, in the administration and he was entitled to have accommodation in the castle. He followed his own father into the ministry of the Church of Ireland at an early age. And then he made a way that is inexplicable even to present day students of uh, uh, the Yeats family. He made his way to Dramara and became a deacon in Dramara. And from Dramara, he was ordained in Dramore Cathedral. And the first appointment he had was in Mara and County Down. The vicar there had approached the bishop and asked him, could he provide him with a curate? And when the curate arrived, he looked at him and he said, I sent for a curate, not for a jockey, because he arrived on a horseback and he is following the father who was very much involved in sporting. The father was a rector in Drumcliff in County Sligo. And he was fond of the good life, hunting and shooting and horse riding. So when he saw the, he brought his horse with him to Mara and said, it was a curate I want, not a jockey. And he was known as the red haired rector from County Down, a good man on a horse. He never was accepted in Tullalish. And this change came about, or his attitude came about, as a result of workers coming into Guildford, into Tullalish, and into the area. There was an influx mostly of Presbyterians. And he saw his church as that of the Anglo Irish settlers, that of Jonathan Swift, Oliver Goldsmith, A.J.R. Stewart, Isaac Butt. He found Tully Leach to be in, uh, lacking in intellectual companionship. His view was that the new wealth that was brought into the area didn't respect his spiritual values, his traditions and his beliefs. As his son would have suggested, who was John uh, Butler Yeats, he said, my father made an error of judgment. His view was that this didn't respect his views of uh, traditions and beliefs. And on arrival in Tully Leash, he made a faux pas by having a resolution passed at the select vestry that only a Protestant of the established church be put on the poor list for aid and assistance. And as a result, he made many enemies of himself. At the same time as this was taking place, there was a Poor Law Union Act being passed, which was to help the needy in the areas that they had identified in Ireland. After all, this particular area around Lurgan was one of three of the most deprived areas in the famine era. The other two was the Atlantis and Skibbereen and Lurgan. And it was customary that a board of governors would be appointed to run and organize the workhouse and the, the union. There were 130 unions established. And when it came to nominating the board of governors, a board of guardians for Banbridge and Lurgan, Reverend William Butler Yeats was entitled to be nominated for either Lurgan or Banbridge since his parish straddled both areas, but he wasn't nominated for either. And this went uh, very much against his uh, ambition 
to become involved in the area. He had another stand up row with the local uh, church, uh, Presbyterian minister, the Reverend John Johnson, and it was over two issues. One was the new education act that was being enacted in uh, 1831. And the William Butler Yeats himself was a promoter for another organization, another uh, London Hibernian uh, society that promoted education. It was uh, scripture based, which didn't appeal to, uh, to the majority of the population. And a mighty row broke out when the Reverend William, uh, the Reverend uh, John Johnson wanted to connect with the new uh, enactment law that was trying to introduce what we now know as integrated education. And he held a meeting in one of the schools in his area, attended by the Reverend William Butler Yeats. And it was a mighty row. It made the headline news in some of the uh, provincial papers and in fact, in the Dublin papers. I should have mentioned, uh, where do we see? I can probably get a, a quotation here that was, yes. Yeah, so this is what happened. One observer at the meeting remarked that he felt that the man, the Reverend William Butler Yeats, who as a private gentleman is amiable and courteous. The Reverend John Johnson in his response attempted to defend himself from intemperate attack upon him and his congregation because they wished to be put their school into the national board. He said, what are you doing Yeats? You can get up a faction, you can bring up a faction to disturb my plans as patron of the school. They rush in a state of drunkenness from public houses kept by some of the men whom you have brought here tonight. So this row went on and he didn't endear himself at all to the congregation. I should have said uh, that all, whilst the, the Reverend William Butler Yeats was in Tullish, he had seven of his 12 uh, members of his family born and christened in a church in Tullish. And most of them bear the name of Butler, William Butler. And that is because of his grandmother, who was a descendant of a Norman dynasty, the Dukes of Ormond. And they were, she was called Mary Butler. And she took pride in the aristocratic residence that the Butler name had. Hence, most of the boys have the name Butler. Uh, some of the adjectives used by the, the, uh, those who wrote biographies, they didn't write one on him, but most uh, family members. Uh, Yeats, The Man and the Masks was written by Richard Elman. And he says, his parishioners in Tullalish were far from respecting him for his piety and humanity. He was a very stupid man, self-opinionated, and his parishioners were delighted to see the back of him when at long last he departed from the county of Down. I must say that's harsh with no evidence whatsoever. And you'll see how the transformation took place during the famine period. He was a complex character in his own right. And some of the biographers have used the following adjectives to describe him, controversial, stupid, opinionated, amiable, kind-hearted, affectionate, genial, brilliant, intemperate. So you get a full a range of adjectives to describe him. In 1853, the Reverend William Butler Yeats left the parish without notification and went to live with his cousin, no, sorry, his brother-in-law, in Sandy Mount Castle, Dublin. There was little communication between him and the parish. And indeed, there is no mention of him 
in the studies that I have done of William Butler Yeats, either in the select first three minutes or even in the archives. We visited the archives in Dublin, the Yeats Society in Sligo, and there is little or no mention of the Reverend William Butler Yeats. He died suddenly in 1862 in his brother-in-law's uh, castle. And the mystery that surrounded aspects of his life continued after his death because the location of his burial site was unknown. And it wasn't until we did a research as a historic society that we found out where he died and where he was buried. And this was unknown even to the Yeats Society. And I read you how it came about and it will show you that there was a complete transformation. In fact, the transformation in his character was due partly because he had moved into Guildford in, uh, well, his house in, uh, uh, where there's a blue plaque on it, by the way, in Drumless Camp in Lawrencetown. He had moved, sitting, having their meals when the skeletal figures of some of those who were starving were gazing through his window. And this really had an effect on him. And he immediately, immediately began a relief committee for the area and did heroic work for the alleviation of the poor and the suffering and those starving. And uh, there's much evidence to suggest that this was a turning point in his career. Now, uh, regarding his, his death, come on, uh, but let Here we have it here, sorry, sorry about that. And it, it's, it's with a sad note that I read this, believe it or not. The location of his final resting place was discovered by our society in an obituary notice in the issue of the Downpatrick Recorder on the 25th of November, 1862. The late Reverend William Butler Yeats, MA, Rector of Tullyleash. This highly honored clergyman died on Monday last at Sandy Mount, Dublin. He had been an invalid for many years. No one knew that. His early ministerial labors will long be remembered at Mara and Tullyleash where he successfully labored. His gifts were abundant, natural and graceful eloquence, winning adoption to all classes and most unselfish devotedness to all his duties distinguished him in his pastoral life. And this is interesting. He taxed his physical powers too severely. He was slow to perceive that while feeding the lamp of charity, he was exhausting the lamp of life. And so for many years, this remarkable minister was unable to sustain the full burden of ministerial requirements. His heart was ever with the great concerning concerns of the Dreamer's kingdom. His conversation was a peculiarly kind, genial, brilliant, and affectionate. He was a contributor to various periodicals and always ready to supply aid from the rich stores of his mind to the cause of literature, piety, and humanity. The remains of this honored and lamented clergyman were interred at Mount St. Jerome, Dublin yesterday. There it is, the man that was, was pilfied in Tullyleash has been sick. He had typhoid and he had been an invalid in many years and that was unknown to the locals. Looking back on that uh, Guildford mill, there was a problem created when they built the mill because this huge mill needed accommodation and the accommodation had to be provided by the mill owner. And so this created a problem housing workers in the right location. 
like all, all our Ulster capitalists, they initially sought to resolve the problem by building houses located close to the mill and ensuring a large measure of control over the social life of their employees. They also introduced the cooperative society. They had shops, grocer shops. Hugh Dunbar began building these houses over a period of time and it's reckoned that he spent in the region of 10,000 pounds building 20 or uh, 200 houses. And here we see the houses in Katy Row, which is just overlooking the mill. You can see them, they're two up and two down. And the occupants were from Katy and County, County uh, Armagh, hence the name. So many people from Katy lived in that row. They called it Katy Row or as Dr. Lyons would have heard them say, Kitty Row, Monaghan, Cavan, Tyrone, Fermanagh, and in a number of cases, they came from as far away as Cork. There were two types of houses. There were these houses that was built by the mill owner, and there were the houses that all our uh, entrepreneurs built who were developing houses, but were of lesser quality than the mill houses because they insisted that the houses were, uh, they were inspected monthly by the owners, annually lime washed or white washed, painted and repaired at the firm's expenses. Before his death in 1847, the original owner and founder, Huden Barr, converted a number of these houses in Katie Row into a fever hospital under the supervision of the local doctor, McBride. There was an apothecary or a chemist shop. And when I was interviewing people for the history of the Guildford Mill, this lady said that her father brought her as a child out to Guildford from Inniskillen and they got the dead house. The dead house was the, uh, 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 what do you call it, the mortuary. And it was exclusively for that use. In his kindness and goodness, Dunbar gave a site on Castle Hill for the building of a Catholic church. He gave land to the Presbyterian church and the Methodist land for their church. The Church of Ireland, however, had to wait a number of years and it wasn't in any way sectarian. It was because there was a Church of Ireland where the Reverend William Butler Yeats was rector just a mile from the church, and they thought that that was sufficient distance for enable them to uh, plan uh, to spend their uh, time in their worshiping, but walking a mile. So, in 1865, the uh, survivor of the uh, entrepreneurs, John Welsh McMaster, he gave it land for the church and the vicarage as well. Dunbar, true to his state in life, he built a school for the folk in Guildford at a very early time during the famine period. And there we have Guildford Mill School. Uh, it was the cost to the firm of providing the three school uh, classrooms, uh, teacher salaries, fire, light, daily cleaning, repairs, annual painting and lime washing was £104. That school was one of the early schools and it was singled out by the inspectorate from Dublin when they said that nearly 2,000 hands in their spinning mill and factory, they have erected a commodious schoolhouse for the instruction of children, boys, girls and infants during the day and for adults and such as could not attend the day school in the evening. In the several departments of which there are 125 boys 98 girls and 61 infants, so quite a total. And they were receiving a most efficient education and moral training. So that was the building of the school. They built the houses. They built give land to the church for their building. There's a, in the, 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 the will of uh, Mass, or, or the deeds, sorry, the deeds that uh, Dunbar, 
had uh, produced were under no circumstances were there to be, uh, was there to be a cemetery in Guildford. And I can understand that the, his house he built was on a height, a lofty height, and he had been looking, have there been their individual cemeteries who had had three to four cemeteries looking into it. Instead, his view overlooked the mill that he could see what was happening. During this period of time, the mill was flourishing. It was flourishing to such an extent that Industries of Ireland, that was a, mag a trade uh, magazine, said that it flourished beyond measure and the firm made money in tubfuls. During this particular period, again, there's evidence of this for several of the partners built large mansions in Guildford and all the industrialists built them up the valley as well. And if we can take the first one here, Hugh. This is a Dunbarton House. The current uh, owner is with us here tonight, uh, viewing this from uh, Putrish, yes. And this is his house, Dunbarton House. Now, I don't know, uh, it has a history. It was used during the First World War as a recuperation for those who had been wounded in the, war, in the, the battlefields and for, it was the uh, Ulster Volunteer Force. And they, we have, Dr. Lyons has the house there just to the left of the doorway. It's, I suppose, a lot dedicated to the memory of the McMaster family and his uh, memorabilia there. It uh, also has in its grounds a narrated shelter. I think it may have been uh, excavated by the American soldiers and still able to move into it. Uh, if you look at the top of the, the roof, you can see a balustrade around there. This balustrade, it seems to be a, a copy of a architectural feature that mariners had in Northeast United States. And what would happen would be there's a, you can walk around that, and it's called the widow's walk. They would have been walking around that, were looking for their husbands coming home from sea. Others suggested that it's a widow's walk is for those who are widowed, rather than be exposed while walking in public, they would do their exercising around the, the top of the roof of the house there. So that Dr. Lyons' house, John Barton house, built by the original uh, owner of the mill and is in pristine condition. The next one is a castle in Guildford, Elmfield Castle. It was built, two brothers, Benjamin and James Dixon, who were part owners in the mill. In 1866, it has been suggested that the profits from the mill and, and their share in the profits enabled them to build this particular castle. This particular castle has a history as well. It was uh, owned by the Pritchard family and it came into the property of the Pritchards through a, a businessman in uh, Belfast, a tea and coffee merchant. And his wife was getting married to a U Pritchard and he is reputed to have bought that as a wedding present for his daughter. His daughter subsequently died having given birth to five of their children and she died of tuberculosis. And her father uh, built Foster Green's hospital, Foster Green being the tea and coffee uh, merchants. And Foster Green's hospital is a memorial to his daughter who died. During the war, it was also the grounds for the Italian prisoners of war and also the Amer uh, German prisoners of war. The Americans didn't come there. They came uh, as uh, in preparation for uh, Dunkirk, was it? The people who inhabited this uh, 
the New Pritchards were interested in horses and they built a replica of uh, Punchestown uh, race course. They also had uh, cork sub uh, soil uh, for their tennis courts so that they could play it in conditions that wouldn't a normal grass play uh, uh, tennis playing on it. So that's that castle. Can we have the other castle, please? This is Guildford Castle. And Guildford Castle is, uh, was built by a brother of the other castle owner. And he built it in the, uh, hoping that he would inhabit it once he would be married. And he didn't allow uh, his fiance to see it until it was built. And when he drove her up in his carriage, she took one look and she says, I'll never spend a night in it. No, neither she did. And uh, it is passed, it's now passed to a new owner uh, who is set about uh, renovating it at the present time. So you had those three houses associated with Guildford Mill together with all the other the workers' houses as well. So there's plenty to see around Guildford if you ever come around there for a drive sometime. By 1867, there was the building and all had ceased, and Guilford now, and the, and the, uh, we concentrate on the leisure activities that were provided by the mill owner. Leisure activities in Guilford Grove reflected the concern for working class self improvement, but they were gender specific. Everything was that I could find were uh, for men only, a young man's mutual improvement society, lectures for the young men on scientific and useful subjects. And they were given by influential public figures in the vicinity, a man's room, library, public lecture room. Uh, the only thing that seemed to be uh, open to the girls uh, was the swimming pool. And we'll see the swimming pool in a moment or two. They encouraged and provided cricket facilities, boating, handball and football, gymnastics were fostered and encouraged. Interesting story that one of the McMasters is one of 12 children. He got his place on the MCC, the cricket team on their tour to South Africa. He was put in to, to bat in the first wicket, uh, in the first innings and the first wicket, he was out for a duck. If we can see, the, that's the, the, the one before that, I think. Yes, there's the swimming pool that they provided for the workers. And uh, the work, that was before the leisure centers were open and they had uh, 60 by 30. Uh, and if you see to the right, there's the Barton and Wellington swimming clubs. There's an error somewhere in that You'll see, notice there, I can't ask you to reply because we're on mute, but you'll see that they held international swimming in Guildford uh, every August. And you'll see that it says stars will complete against Irish international swimmers. So there you have the swimming and next slide. I think time is pushing on. Uh, the, we saw, we did see the, the Barton Bowling Club. And here we have the, what, the wet spinning. And I'm, I'm ahead of myself now. If we could just dispense with that for a moment. I must have given you the wrong order. Yes, the, these are workers leaving the mill to go home. And you can see on the right, young boys with their bare feet. I'll go now to just, I think time is moving on. The grandmothers would have been down at the factory, at the mill gate uh, uh, with their children in arms at lunchtime, waiting for the mother to come from the mill and feed the children, and then they would return home afterwards. So there was no such thing as a national health scheme. What they did have 
was a scheme where you were given, uh, taken a penny per pound out of your wages towards a, a fund to uh, deal with the, those who were on sick leave or those who had died. And they had an arrangement with the Royal Victoria Hospital for those who needed spiceless treatment, and that was free of charge. So in all, they, these uh, were employers were really kind and good to their employees. The harsh words would have been saying about them, but uh, there's no evidence to prove that they were in any way treated as slave labor for it didn't happen. <clears throat> An interesting thing happened after the American Civil War. The American Civil War brought great prosperity to the mills on the Ban Valley. They had, as you know, there were two competing armies and the cotton fields were the theaters of war and there was limited supply of cotton for the uniforms and all the necessities of war. So what they had to depend on was the imported linen uh, from Ireland. After the war was over, the Americans imposed a tax on imported linen. And that left them at a, uh, the Irish uh, uh, on, um, uh, entrepreneurs at a disadvantage. They followed the example of barbers of uh, Lisburn. They went out to America and bought a factory and started to manufacture the thread and the yarn. And so McMaster's with two of his sons set off to America and uh, went around the states around New York until eventually in Greenwich, upper New York, they got a factory for their purpose of bringing over the machinery and starting uh, uh, linen, uh, thread and yarn in uh, Greenwich. With the result that a lot of immigrants went from Guildford out to Greenwich and they still, there's still the connection between Greenwich and Guildford. Now, there is a book, two volumes of a book by William Ruddock, whose great grandfather left, and he has taken the names of every uh, worker who left Guildford and went to live in, in, in Greenwich. And there are two volumes of that. I'm skipping through it because time is, uh, nearly up for us. They, an interesting thing happened uh, in 1895. They got 300 tons of coal delivered to the Madden through Newry and the Newry Canal. And it was priced at 10 and 6 a ton, which the factory owners refused to pay because they thought it was inferior coal. So they wrote back and said they got an independent survey done and that the coal was only worth seven and threepence per ton. And they sent them a check for the seven and threepence per ton for the 300 and told them if it wasn't accepted, then they would start charging rent for its storage at the Madden station. At this particular time, Industries of Ireland stated that the enterprise in the Ban Valley in Guildford Mill is an establishment which in our opinion is quite unsurpassed in the British Isles in the completeness of its resources for all the processes of the industry to which it's devoted. Give you some statistics. Fine thread that was for embroidery that was woven in Guildford Mill was sold by weight and a weight of the finest thread stretched approximately 36,000 yards, which would be nearly 20 miles. And the yarn produced in a week was 75,000 miles, which would be five times around the earth. Another interesting character I can't leave you without mentioning is a Jubilee Nursing Society. And on 1901, and a Jubilee nurse arrived in Guildford called Annie M.P. Smithson. Annie M.P. Smithson came from Dublin and established herself in Guildford. 
and well, fortunately or unfortunately, she fell in love with a local doctor who was living in an apartment in Guildford Castle called Dr. Manton. She realized after a number of years that there was no uh, future for it. And she left Guildford and went back to Dublin. And she wrote her autobiography called Myself and Others. And she took to the writing and in total, she wrote 22 novels and two short story collections. Fortunately, if, or unfortunately, she became involved in politics in the South and became involved in the 1916 Rising. She was, I didn't know till recently, there's a trip being organized for the writers in the Ban Valley and she was mentioned as, as one of them. Uh, and it can be had by uh, through the different libraries in the area. 1901 was a big occasion for Guilford Mill and all the mills on the River Valley. A linen thread company was established whereby 26 factories joined together as one cooperative movement. And this new operation opened markets all over the world, centralized the areas of linen production. And Guilford was given the linen thread, not the, uh, sorry, the linen yarn to uh, produce. And their speciality uh, was linen thread, that linen thread that I told you about, the gossamer spread, thin spread thread and uh, used for purposes during the war for wings of airplanes, that's the First World War. Uh, in 1907, uh, the, the dynasty of the McMasters uh, came to an end. The McMaster died and uh, the name McMaster no longer exists. It is, uh, during the, uh, the uh, post-war, it did have times of great business transactions, but eventually with the coming of man-made fibers, the industry and linen, as you all know, came to a sudden death in the late uh, 1980s, in as a case in Guildford was one of the last. It was, uh, it, if we could go back, uh, no, forward again, uh, all that remains in memory of the McMasters is this lamp, uh, originally gas, and its faith, hope, and charity was christened the, in keeping with the religious tradition of uh, the owners of the mill. Can I say that uh, another episode that happened, and I, I uh, will tell you about now, in 19 and 20, the auction, uh, the financial uh, advisor in the mill, who was the uh, uh, secretary as well, he made his weekly journey to Banbridge for the wages. He was driven by a William Madole from Guildford, who was happened to be a Protestant and a taxi driver and a mechanic. The William McConville was the secretary and he was a Catholic. Two of them were coming by motor car from Banbridge to Guildford. And as you approach Gilbury Fair, they noticed that this car was stopped and the driver had the bonnet up. And uh, William Madole said to William McConville, we'll stop here. Now William McConville had a bag with 1,309 pounds being the wages for the miller, mill workers. And as he approached, McConville advised him not to, that he was sitting in the back seat, shivering with a ho hope that nothing untoward would happen. Uh, Madole, being kind-hearted, stopped the car and jumped out to help. Whereupon William Conlon, one of the three boys who were in the car, produced a revolver and shot Madole in the neck 
and shot him dead. They took McConville and threw him over the wall and McConville arrived rolling down the bank to the edge of the river. The three boys, one was McCon uh, McConlon, a local, one was O'Boyle from Berra, and one was Rogers from Six Mile Cross. They were subsequently caught and tried in 1921 and were reprieved, whereupon they were retried in Victoria Barracks and sentenced to life imprisonment. In 1927, uh, by the way, McConville was tried, but he was found innocent. In 1927, they escaped from uh, Crumlin Road Jail and Colin was caught uh, on the Falls Road. The other two boys made their escape to Dublin. Colin pleaded with, uh, his plea was that he had been to America and he was a uh, nationalized American. The other two boys, O'Boyle and Rogers, they, there was no extradition treaty and they were released in Dublin. Afterwards, as one would imagine, the relationship in the mill wasn't good because of the dastardly act of William Madole being killed. But at least it was a very short time afterwards, common sense prevailed and normality returned to Guildford Mill. But it was an episode that uh, caused a lot of hardship and caused a lot of, uh, well, ill feeling in the vicinity. But thank God that, that day is over and gone with. But it's a thing that, uh, an event that is seldom known by, the, by locals, but maybe it's because of the fact that it was a sectarian in its nature, but it was never, money never was found. And uh, those, Colin, was reputed to have been murdered by the Mafia. He, he returned to America, but he died of natural causes in uh, 1944. So I, I thought that would be interesting to tell you. And uh, the spinning, the girl at the spinning mill, uh, if you can see it. Yes, this is a wet spinning where the, the temperature in there, the water would be 80 to 100 degrees. And this had a severe uh, impact on their health. They were breathing in pouse. They had uh, a hot atmosphere going out into the cold atmosphere. People suffered from bronchial and respiratory complaints and also uh, the wet spinning, they had the warm atmosphere going out into the cold and life was pretty unpleasant at times. So I'm coming now to the end and I've rushed it because I see that my time is up. But just to give you some other interesting statistics, in the late 19th century, the average life expectancy of a mill worker was 46 years and 56 years male, female. In mill working life was 27 and a half years, the, will, the mill working life. For one uh, exercise in the mill and one uh, process, carding is particularly dirty and the working life expectancy for working there was 15 to 17 years. Life expectancy was non-existent. Factory acts weren't really enacted until 1891 and Harsh reality of life was that the children were encouraged at school uh, to make a visit to the mill and to choose their occupation that they'd like because, uh, that they would enjoy, and they contributed to the family's financial. Back from the nineties. Sorry. Past time. Duncan. Yes. Thank you very much say, for that very very interesting talk. Excuse me one moment. Turn the volume on. Sorry, my wife's listening here at the other end of the table, so I'm trying to get that echo stopped. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much to say for a very interesting talk. I hadn't realized that WB Yates was, that family was so involved with the area. So that's a bit of new knowledge for me. The the whole linen industry, yes, the scale that it achieved in Ireland was immense. And 
it's nice to see some of the statistics about that because growing up in this part of the world, of course, the flax dams were everywhere. I do remember seeing them, never in use actually, but there they were with the stones either bank. And my father often talked about the process of retting the flax uh, and what a dirty, rotten job it was. Yes. So are there any questions from other people? Could I just read you just as a, as a memorial headstones to the past? There's only two verses. Do you mind? Yes, go on ahead. The mills have fallen silent down the valley. Their horns no longer sound along the bam. Cold rain beats in between the slateless rafters. Long grass grows where the rushing mill race ran. The jewels of the linen lords lie scattered. Headstones to the changing whims of man. The hopes, the dreams, the citadels of linen lie tumbled in the fields beside the barn. Very nice. Very good, yes. That's a fair reflection of what it would have looked at, like at yeah. the time the poem was written, yes. Was yeah. to say, are there questions from other people? So Roy, uh, if somebody wants to ask a question, can they just unmute themselves, first of all? Ah, yes, all this technology details. Or put your hand up and we'll only meet you. We'll try to unmute you. Hello, Keith. Uh, um, my mother uh, has worked in Bestbrook Mill, I remember telling but um, my internet was going on and off, so I might have missed, I might have spoken about it, but she, spoke, she was talking about uh, when she was at it, she worked in the Dama Squeaving, I know it was. Uh, I don't know why it was similar to Bedford Mill to Guildford Mill, but did anyone know what damask weaving was? Or yeah, yes, it was a pattern woven into the uh, the, the the fabric. Oh, right, right. Okay. Design. It was the it was the elite. Oh, right. <laughs> yes, yes, it was very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question answer. Thanks very much. Sorry, sorry. I was I was late coming in. Apologize for that. But I bet maybe missed this. Maybe it was mentioned. Maybe it was mentioned earlier. But what's happening to, to the Guildford Mill now? Well, the Guildford Mill. The future looks very rosy for Guildford Mill now. It has been bought by uh, an asset, uh, uh, Carl Asset Management, and uh, the plans are. In fact, I, I have noticed they have uh, solar panels on the, the roof of it. It's a six-story building. As you can see, yeah, I saw the. I know they spent money and they've done a lot of work there, but it seemed right. to do it. It seemed to do a lot early on, and then it stopped for a long time. I mean, that was years back. Yeah, yeah, but now the the plans are that there are six stories. The bottom two stories are for a garden center. Right, good. The next four stories will have uh, eight, eight eight apartments in each story. There will be a restaurant. And then hopefully they'll have the mill pond restored to its former beauty. And then they'll have a, a lot of nice, hopefully, uh, grounds, you know, tailored to suit walk for walks and that type of thing around it. So that's the, is that working on at the moment? It is, or is it? Is well, it... I saw them, I saw them uh, on top of the roof, uh, repairing the roof. Of it. Right, good, good, good. Yeah, so uh, uh, I would have high hopes that uh, materialise. Uh, it's going to be late brought back into the middle there again. That's good, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, certainly it would be nice to see Gilbert Mill re well, I was going to say reinstated, be reinvigorated would be the West yes. there, yeah. and being a thriving centre for the village. So yeah. I look forward to that and hope it takes place pretty soon. And you'll come to the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Plunkett, uh, Plunkett, I've just got one question, one observation. The first yeah. observation really is is um, the walk around Elmfield Castle. I think the owner is still here, is he? It doesn't look like it's something that would pass health and safety inspection. Elmfield Castle. The walk around the, the walk around the the, the, the rooftop. The rooftop. It looks oh, a bit uh, scary. Did you see them? Did you see them going on it? No, no, but um, just from the photograph, 
Oh, well, you're it, talking about uh, Dumbarton House. Dumb, sorry, Dumbarton House, yes. Sorry, Dumbarton House. Uh, well, I, I tell you, uh, uh, Dr. Lance is here. If he'd come on, he'll tell you how, how secure it is for he. He's the current resident in it. Can Dr. Lance? He's lost. Uh, he might have dropped. I don't see him. Yeah. Uh, so just while we're waiting on that, uh, uh, Plunkett, um, the uh, I noticed that the tower on the on the Elmfield Castle, and the tower even on Guildford Castle, both those towers seem to are not unlike the the tower of of uh, Clare Castle. So you know, at the start of the nineteenth century, was there a uh, was there a fashion to build towers on your on your big houses, even though they didn't really have any much of a functional purpose? Uh, I, I don't quite know because uh, I know that uh, in Guildford Castle, no, Ellenfield Castle, uh, it's uh, they they took the roof and all off Guildford Castle in order to avoid rates at one stage when that was uh, the custom, and there were trees growing up through it, and it had been reinstated, you know, to. Uh, well, it's, it's smaller in size than the original was, but I, I, I don't know uh, here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lance is not there because to, to access the, the roof, you, you go up through the center of the house. So you don't go from outside into the, the balustrade, the balustrade around it. All right. Okay. You talk, Plunkett, about the Ban Valley, and I suppose perhaps. It's because we're from that part of the country that we think the Ban Valley was the most important in the linen industry. But was it equally important in the lower Ban or in other river systems? Well, I tell you, uh, there's a restriction on what they could do in the lower part of the upper Ban. From Moy Allen to Loch Ness, you couldn't bleach because the water... The river ran through uh, uh, a sort of a bog land, you know. You'd see yeah. it there in the win uh, winter time in the floods, and that wouldn't be suitable for the uh, bleaching purposes. But I always uh, attributed uh, the, the development of the linen industry to the the Ban Valley, and but if you if you go if you go elsewhere, you have the Myola, and you yeah. have the Lagan. But if you're talking about the size and dimension, there are very few mills the size of Guilford Mill. Now, Richardson and Bestbrook, the gentleman there was speaking about Bestbrook, it's quite a sizable mill. Yes. I, I don't know what the labor force was, but at its heyday, the labor force in Guilford was over 2,000. Well, where was it drawing? Was it a water-driven mill? Where was it drawing its water from? The, the River Ban. Guilford, are you talking about uh, Bestbrook? Bestbrook. Bestbrook was, uh, probably it was a later vintage. Ah, oh, right. Yes. Steam. Yes. Yes. Steam. Yes. <coughs> okay, if there's no more questions, shall we call it a halt to proceedings, please? With our very, very grateful thanks to Plunkett mm -hmm. for such an entertaining and illustrious talk. Uh, we hope to see you all again for our next talk, which will be on the first Thursday of, what's this, May? May. Of May. As I say, we'll let you know before then exactly who is going to speak then. Uh, I think there's just a small degree of uh, discussion going on about that at the moment. But... I thought I was going to be speaking next month. Who? I thought I was speaking next month. I was on April April fail. <laughs> Thank you very I'm sure we'll hear you, Francie, no doubt. Uh, until we meet again, and to all those friends who we don't normally see in the points pass meetings and can manage to see online, it is brilliant seeing you all. So, Roy, can I say as well that before we hang up, that uh, for those who missed it and those who want to listen to uh, Plunkers talk again, uh, we will be, we, we have been recording this and it will be made available uh, on YouTube uh, and 
we will make the we will provide the link to our history society um, Facebook page. So, uh, so if if you if you don't if you're not on Facebook, um, then ask somebody who is uh, to go to our our history society points past and district local history society uh, Facebook page, and you will get the link. It'll be on there in about a, a about a week or two's time, about a week's time anyway. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Good night, everybody. Right. Thank right. You. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.